the MVRTV, the author of the Red 7 residential complex in Moscow, Vinny Maas. Architect, the head of the Speech Bureau in Moscow, and Choban was architect in Berlin, the winner of the special prize on the Venice Biennale, Sergei Choban. The host of the talk show, architect, co-founder, and the editor-in-chief of the Arc Daily Internet Resource, which is the key media in architecture world, David Basulto. Hello. Good morning. Uh, I'm very happy to be here presenting this amazing group of uh, Russian and European architects. Um, with the urban uh, world population on track to double in only a few decades, housing is one of our biggest challenges, having to accommodate billions of people. In developed and developing countries, architecture is facing the question of scalability a question that we first confront in the post-war era, where standardization and repetition were the way to deal with the scale of this problem. Adopting the rationalization of the industrial production and repetition. Today, we're facing this problem again, but in a larger scale and with different technologies. The current state of production allows us to mass produce, but now with customization in an efficient way. So a new question appears, how we will adopt these technologies through architecture to develop the cities we need for this near future? Globalization, building technologies, market forces, heritage, belonging, communities, or the fast changing trends of society are some of the challenges for housing. Today, we're with this uh, renowned group of architects from Russia and Europe to learn how they are approaching this challenge. Um, Bini Mas from MBRDB, a firm that started when the then young partners won the European housing competition. Since then, MBRDB has developed a strong body of work from the urban scale to houses to publications. But they are globally recognized for the innovative housing schemes with projects around the world that have become case studies of contemporary housing. Currently, they are working on Red 7, their first project in Russia. Yuri Grigorian, founder of Project Meganom, architect and educator, Yuri is one of Russia's leading architects. Project Meganom has a strong focus on research and has been involved in projects that will change the face of Moscow, such as the Push Pashkin Museum extension or the SEAL development, the reconversion of a former industrial site that will house 50,000 people. He's also working on what will be Manhattan's tallest skyscraper. Sergei Choban, founder of Speech, firm in Russia, and partner of Choban Boss in Germany. Between the two, he has a strong body of work, being one of Russia's most prolific and largest practices. His recent projects include Moscow's iconic Federation Tower. He also runs the Architecture Drawing Museum in Berlin, with drawing as one of his life's passion, a method of research. And we're also joined by Renier de Graaf, partner of OMA, a global firm based in the Netherlands. OMA is known for the strong relationship between research and the project. And Renier has recently launched his book, Four Walls and a Roof, The Complex Nature of a Simple Profession, where he analyzes the forces that are shaping housing. He has been the partner in charge for master planning projects here in Russia and for recent housing projects in Rotterdam, London, and Stockholm. So now I invite Bini Mas to present us what he has been doing in terms of housing. <laughs> Okay, let's try the first slide. I cannot see it yet. Does it work here? Now it's working. Mm. 
Mm, it doesn't, my handset doesn't work either. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's nice to speak with you and with the panel on uh, next uh, housing uh, because we are facing indeed a production in the past that has, um, can be called a kind of monochrome, um, both in many countries, both in Russia, as say in Asia or um, in the central parts of uh, Europe, leading to this kind of suggestions. And at the moment that a younger generation would like to choose and pick their pieces, they cannot choose, as there's only one to choose from. So we face, of course, in, in many places, a kind of new middle class or lower middle class that is more, uh, that is more trained, that has more access to sources, that would like to perform in a wider way. That adds with new lifestyles, there, is a, there are new economies come up out of that generation and that wishes. There are new diversities and new kind of say um, people that uh, arrive, that are new ways of organizations that are surrounding them and there are new ways of interacting because of media uh, and leading to different kind of products. Yes, maybe there are new <laughs> kind of housing to be expected also in, um, in Russia therefore. It, is, uh, it focuses on, uh, beyond, central, on beyond, say, standardization uh, somehow, and more about, say, accommodation. I would like to show you some projects that try to celebrate that. I take you first to Taipei, where we are working at the moment, as we speak, on the vertical village, which is dealing with the idea that this is not an ideal only, uh, that you, some would like this kind of houses, others would like to have a mini tower, there are people that would like to have twins. Um, there are people that love factories and lofts. There are people that have more wings or are more Catholic. Or there are people that uh, uh, emphasize their being with this kind of environments up to this kind of modernistic elements. So if you look at that and you say you would like also to give more access to material or to landscape in that way per product, per house, and you would give that from doors to kitchens to fences to spaces, then people can choose from a small scale to a big scale. So we tried to work that and uh, then people picked in this plot this kind of houses that they would like to do, calculated the price and started to put it on top of each other. And somehow you get a kind of say combination of intensity and uh, variety or diversity as so. So it has grown over the last two years in a project that looks like this as a model that can be uh, uh, soon there, and uh, which is a kind of counter model of the towers that you see next door on this place. And these are the dreaming images that we, um, we can, that show in, of course, in the Chinese, Taiwanese way, how we go through this village from the bottom to the top, how we hang out in between, and how somehow uh, a kind of new poetry could be imagined. Second step in this um, accommodation, Eindhoven, that's somewhere in the Netherlands. And I call it we go. From ego to we go is what we are trying to face. Here you see 17 architects that are working for 17 clients in that way. And they made for every client their dream house. And if you look to that, uh, such a character, uh, basically he wants the bowling alley and a good place to sleep or uh, a character like this which come to that kind of house or such a kind of house you see that in ourselves with a little bit of training we do have a lot of wishes and desires and i love that variety that is there and that can be shown and that's what architecture can help that is what we can bring to our world so if you make this at that very moment and you put it of course in suburbia no problem at all but at the moment that we try to put that in our building codes into a kind of apartment building, hmm, then we have to talk. And then we have to see how that puzzles in. So we developed this game, and especially the blind game works pretty well, because you don't know what the other is doing, that can help you after the ideals to settle the arrangement as such. It's a negotiator uh, where you have your influence uh, in the screen and gradually when you formulate your ideal and your position, you're confronted with your surrounding that attacks you, but that also uh, you have to defend that. And that leads to this ultimately negotiation act. One thing to add to that, where is my core? Where is the axis? So the axis, as you can see here, follows the composition. And I think that's more, that's fantastic. It becomes a walk 
that in the end leads to a beautiful vertical composition. If we look to the satisfaction factor of these different games, I'm happy with 75% what this blind gaming is uh, doing and leading to this puzzle at that very moment. So here, these are the patterns that came out of it, how they are composed together from one side to the other, other side, and how they lead to houses that are amazing in themselves, but also they are confronted with a peek through, there's someone that peeks to you. It becomes like intricate if you see, the, you see your neighbor almost indirectly and you want to go uh, around. So from an ego, we become we go under this kind of pressure, is what these uh, elements are showing in, the, in this example as such, which is now, say, under testing. So we tested it in Eindhoven with this small example for fire reasons, for access, how you can, what, what do you need uh, to that, how does it look like on scale one to two, to be honest, uh, because that was the financial constraints, and that leading to this, uh, this puzzle that um, is uh, going to be there very soon. This has a history um, of already that we started in Amsterdam, where had we made this silo dam housing, where you, um, it's basically a big block of different typologies, different people living together. They all have their own neighborhoods, I would say, with their own access and their own collectivity. And if you mingle them in this negotiation process, it leads to a series of floor plans that are connected and that leave a space to walk around in between. Yes, you have normal apartments, you have partners with, uh, with patios, you have partners atop of another one. And in between you can walk from the bottom through the terraces to the harbor that's incorporated along the galleries into the collective uh, shortcuts uh, via the sports shortcut up to the roof where collective spaces are imagined. So yes, variety is buildable and leads to a kind of pride uh, between uh, the people that welcome you on board. I want to bring you now to Moscow. It's almost uh, uh, where this is my last part of today's uh, contribution, where we try with PIC, uh, which uh, a company that I adore, starting from a kind of mass Haussian, very standardized, and trying to work on a kind of um, um, a system where that could be much uh, varied. We, we love this spot next to the river. It's on this uh, side. Uh, where we are confronted with a new, say, urban generation, new demands are surrounding it, but on the same moment, also these apartments that you know so well and many people love also, is, are there. So what to do on this site is what we try to do. So if this is the density that is required, and this is the technology, basically, that we can do, so we can bend already buildings more and more, then we can start to work on a system of access, including these uh, different typologies, that lead to, a, to, like I showed before, to a slab building on this side. But a slab it was not possible to make, too high, so we had to make it longer, and then it sticks out of the site. Oy. So what we tried to, that is the longest slab in the world we would make. Mm. Should we do that? Or can it provide something? So by giving, using the roof for access that you can walk and be together, Moscow gets its first hill, I would say, in this place. But it doesn't fit. So we have to bend it so that there is a courtyard building that you can go up. You have another courtyard building to add to another one and another one. And together they declare a kind of uh, advertisement of, um, uh, of this operation. And yes, when you wa walk along the river, you can see the path and you can see the signature that is over the passing by and that you are invited to go to uh, from the bottom, gradually up to the top, where you have this beautiful view up to the Kremlin and the city center, and then going down again. That could be the next Moscow enterprise, showing what in that way the ingredients are of next housing. Adaptation and collectivation are part of that operation. I end with a PS. Uh, where I would like to reveal a little bit of the recent research that is there. It's on the go. It is like uh, trying to find a technique that you can change and adapt as easy as possible. You can see here how a person, how much space you need for cooking in that way. And if I go and cook together, then this is say, um, what you basically need. You don't need everything, and you can start to imagine how a space is, say, connected to you. So if you imagine your house and every dot is a house, 
and you will have to negotiate with your neighbor, then the nucleus of your house does that in this kind of scripting. And uh, if you see how kind of space that will be, your desires that are there, and here this program analyzes the black zones, the zones of conflict, and trying to avoid that. So yes, architectures uh, are about, say, making space, and we need to facilitate our, say, technology uh, designers with this kind of, say, language to, uh, to be that you can make your own house in the future. I'm aware 3D is very complicated, so we do it 2.5D, I have to admit that, to make it uh, possible in the technology. And what is then next? Then here with this kind of, say, cartridges, we make now this composition over the houses during the day, it's a hotel, actually, that we are trying to do, and makes your configuration on the spot. And then we can imagine that in a while we can like live, uh, this is the dream for next year to be done, when you come to, uh, to this kind of environment, say at, at that Friday end of the day, you see this house in front of you, this, and it comes to you, it, it says how you can enter. And it, it opens itself when you come there, it becomes, the cartridges become a lift basically, so that you can go from the bottom to the top. Here you come and there you go to your house that is for you, is what it wants to do. On the spot, on the go, as we talk. How to do that is my last question in that way. Yes, there is technology needed to do that. Very simple combination of carbon and, uh, and sensors and machinery done in a German factory that leads to this kind of, say, detailing that we can imagine for such a kind of adaptation and that then we can imagine gradually, as you can see maybe in this film, if it works, I hope so. Ay, 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 ay. That's one film missing, how the prototype is now working. So I have to, uh, to get you next time to Eindhoven to show it in, the, in a year from now, how adaptation can be combined on the go. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bini, for sharing with us also how you're using technology in an effective way to drive the project of housing. Um, now I want to invite Judy to present us what she has been doing in housing. Thank you very much. If someone could bring my presentation on the screen, I will be delighted to tell you about our latest project. We've been working on recently. Well, I'm waiting for my presentation. Let me make an introduction. One of the most interesting projects we ever worked on in terms of housing would be a Manhattan Tower that consists of 36 apartments. This um, is luxury housing, to be frank. But in that project, we wanted to reflect all principles that we hold important. It's a vertical village with a core that's outside and that leaves a room empty, 12 by 16 meters, ceiling height is 360. So in this large empty space, let me try with the presentation again. So this is the building. Its core is in the back, and every space within the building can be transformed. Either you can use a standard arrangement, but this potential that this free, open, empty space holds is always there. So even if you decide to create a three-bedroom apartment within this space, or a four-bedroom apartment, because every apartment is 
has floor space of 100, 250 meters. That is an option, but still, this emptiness has great potential. This volume, this emptiness is there for you. So in case of this building, we achieved a lot of flexibility. And we were contemplating that since the building is there to stay for a long time, so at some point we were hoping people, residents would clear those units because they're south, north access oriented. So if they cleared the space, they would get a unique view. And this in itself would be a unique characteristic of the space. You can see the floor space here. You clearly see the principle. So this is the potential that the space holds. And these are potential arrangements, structures you can add to the space. So on, on the one hand, you can customize these apartments in a very flexible way. And on the other hand, you see a large selection of very conservative arrangements. Because we understand that some people, for instance, would say that the simpler the apartment is, the better. So we offer a range of options. And you can change the space of rooms. There are, for instance, double floors that allow you to set up a bathroom in any point in the apartment. We have a library of standard solutions, about 80 of them. But also we have a large number of out-of-the-ordinary suggestions. And then people at any point of their lives can decide to change the arrangement and create a very personal, a very unique space. And it will be important from the point of view of the personal development. This is not a very striking example, probably, because this is a very specific type of housing in a very special place. So this is not something that can be easily replicated. But in all of our projects, we try to deviate from the general trend, not limit ourselves to just sell an apartment. In Russia, housing is something very conservative. Today, I guess we could say that architects are less and less engaged in designing houses because there are some standard types, and there isn't much you can do in terms of new solutions of mass housing. And uh, it's really depressing because young architects today design new arrangements for existing types of buildings. We have an educational program, program we call Auditorium. We work with Architecture Institute on that. Just day before yesterday, we signed an agreement with Pushkin Museum, agreement on cooperation, because we want to do research for long-term projects together with them. But also, we think it'd be very important if we could also deal with ordinary. Next year, we're going to be focusing on these ordinary houses, standardized houses, because I believe architects need to stay in charge when we talk about environment. If we talk about urban environment, we've had this experience in zeal together with Moscow city authorities. We created a park where there used to be an industrial area. But the general trend is increased density and free spaces decrease, so does air, and that's alarming. Another topic I find interesting is how student projects can transform into startups. There is 
this connection between Urban Forum that happened four years ago, if I'm not mistaken, where we introduced the research we did, archaeology of periphery, and Dvor Ulitsa Street in a Yard project. Those two were implemented back then, and this Dvor Ulitsa has evolved into a startup. But initially, it was a student thesis. And it's important to make sure we give support to talented students, implement their projects in practice, and empower them to have a say, to have impact on the city. Thank you. I'll uh, deload Sergei's presentation. I wanted to ask you a quick question. Um, is there something that you learned from New York doing this project that uh, has been present in your recent projects here in Moscow? Uh, you mean New York project? Mm -hmm. uh, da, yes. We certainly did. It was exceptionally educational. It was a journey that still continues because we l analyzed New York zoning principle a lot. And once you've worked in New York, it's really interesting to come back to Moscow because there's no such thing as zoning in Moscow. It can never exist because Moscow is driven by politics. At the same time, there are certain powers that are still present in Moscow that treat Moscow as landscape, as a beautiful landscape. And since Moscow, just as Russia, is half east, half west, this balance between order and chaos is something that offers opportunities, but also it makes you develop new ways of behavior in the city. So yeah, New York was an incredible experience. Uh, and now I give the screen to Sergi. So. Thank you very much. I will speak Russian since most of our audience are Russians. So I'll share my views. If we talk about Russia, although it's very similar to what we see elsewhere in the world, I think that it happens less and less frequently that we have a clear image of what a city is, not just in terms of how it is composed, residential areas, parks, but also from the point of view of altitudes, of heights. Because if we talk about residential buildings, this is the backbone of any city, and Yuri was right in saying that residential buildings are very conservative. It's a conservative part of urban environment. Since I studied, since I became architect, office spaces have changed a lot. And I can very well imagine, very well imagine uh, an office building that's built and then 30 years later it will be demolished. And even if it was a landmark building, it can still go. And no one's going to mourn and complain. Residential buildings are different because these are places where we reconnect the dots and where we're happy to come back. I'm always happy to come back to St. Petersburg, to my parents' house, to the apartment where I grew up. But modern type of houses are becoming more temporary and inhumane in a sense. And I see three problems we need to focus on in Russia's reality. First is that the buildings were built are just too tall. I understand we need to make square meters work. This is our commitment. But this commitment is too high and too dense. I was just, just before the session, I visited a consumer, my customer who 
who's based in a different part of town. So as you go through Moscow, this is the landscape you see. And one might ask a question, why are we building so high? Do we not have enough land? Is this an optimal height? Do what urban environment are we creating? I think it's harmful. I think it's temporary. I think it results in gentrification because that those that live in upper floors are diselected, the, the top 5%, and those that live below are less privileged. So I don't think this is an optimal solution for residential buildings. In some of our Russian projects, Moscow projects, and especially in projects that we do in the West, we manage to create different types of houses in terms of height, in terms of spaces. And I think we need to analyze what's happening now and give up what we're doing now as soon as possible. Because one high-rise building can become center of gravity, can set the scale, but a city cannot be composed entirely out of high rise or skyscrapers. Right now, the average is 10 to 12 floors. Well, I think that normal for a human being is 6 to 7 floors. This is comfortable. Russia has always strived to be part of Europe, and a European city is, a, is an asset. It's a value in itself. And it means that buildings should not be too high. They should be unique. Materials used should be durable, because residential buildings should be durable, by definition. So this integration of something new into the existing cityscape, building houses that will not be imposing, housing for different social groups of people that could coexist is very important. Uh, when we worked on master plan for Skolkovo, and three out of four speakers participated in this master plan, so the idea, one of the main priorities of this master plan was to limit the height of buildings to five floors. And this is human scale. And I think a city should be composed of those low-rise buildings 70%. Another problem we have is that density is too high. Not only are the buildings too high, but so is density. We approve such projects in our architectural council, and I keep wondering why. Because this density, horizontal and vertical, and this is true project on the screen, in my view, is below optimal. I don't see why we do that. Construction should be humane. It should leave space for people to breathe, to exist, to be comfortable in a space. So height and density should not be overwhelming, it should not be too high. And people of different income should coexist in the same districts. And the third problem we have is that our residential buildings are becoming more and more closed. First, because we lack order, and people very often try to expand their living spaces and build up their existing flats. So look at what we see on the screen. This has ruined many beautiful buildings, many precious buildings that date back to constructivist times, to the 40s, to the 50s. This is very typical for our streets. But it's impossible to think of this build, these type of buildings today because even when we design developers, they tell us, even when we design the buildings, developers tell us, oh, please make sure 
all sp all open spaces are covered because otherwise presidents will immediately do it themselves. This is something we need to fight on the platform of those fora, such as this one, because otherwise we'll end up with flat buildings without balconies. And that reduces dramatically the quality of life, because any building should interact with the surrounding environment, should be open to the environment. And I refuse to talk about Moscow's climate as bad climate, because I've been to Copenhagen, I've been to many northern cities, and they're open. Look at Berlin, look at Hamburg. This is a residential building from Berlin. So this is a semi-space. It's not quite in, it's not quite out. And this is an important function of a residential building, something we've lost along the way. How that happened, I don't know, because people lack order. But we need to win back this opportunity to create residential buildings that will be open to the environment, that would communicate with the environment. Thank you, Sergey, for showing us all these principles illustrated through such diverse projects. And now we wait for your presentation to Lord Rainier. Do I just press next? Oh, no, I don't. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak on this panel um, about modern housing. Um, I have a lingering feeling that things become the subject of discussion uh, precisely at the moment they're no longer uh, there. Um, I will try to explain. Um, Modern housing died in 1972. This is an iconic image uh, of the Pruitt Igo estate in St. Louis, uh, a modern housing uh, estate built in the late 1950s, also a social uh, housing estate meant to replace slums in the American city, which was demolished a mere 18 years after it was constructed. Uh, in the words of Charles Jenks, uh, a well-known um, architectural critic, uh, essentially that meant the coup de grace for modern ideas about modern housing uh, and about modern architecture in uh, general. Um, in a way, Pruitt Igo is a precursor because modern uh, housing has died many times since. This is uh, 1994, demolition of a social housing estate in Lyon, in Sheffield, Chicago, Dublin, Naples, Paris, Lyon again, Nantes, uh, Belfast, Glasgow, Lyon, uh, again one in Paris, Glasgow. I could do this for the next 10 minutes. Um, uh, and uh, uh, also in, in Germany. It is very interesting uh, phenomena. Uh, the question of modern housing was intimately tied to social housing, to providing housing at an affordable price for many. And it's very interesting that when social housing experiments do not get demolished, they get privatized. The small apartments, once the existence minimum for, uh, for the average person is privatized and sold at a price that is barely affordable for the average person. The price of this apartment, this one room, a bedroom flat, uh, is over 300,000 pounds when the average UK person can get a mortgage for 150,000 pounds. Therefore, it is definitively unaffordable uh, for normal people. Modern housing, uh, in a way, has changed sides, you could say. Modern housing has become part of a race to build cheaply but sell as expensively as possible. Uh, in Amsterdam, a modern, uh, recent modern project with an apartment sold for 16 million uh, euro. That is a very high price for Amsterdam. But it's nothing compared to what happens uh, in places like London. Property tycoon Nick Candy bought this penthouse for 100 million pounds and in 
interestingly, he bought it from himself. One company uh, bought uh, the, the apartment from another one uh, of his companies to simply set a record price to sell the apartments as expensive as possible. This is the record at the moment in the Vignoli Tower, an apartment for the CEO of Dell Technologies, a penthouse sold over 160 million. This Vignoli Tower is a very interesting uh, tower. Strangely, I think the inhabitants have agreed that only on every 14 floors are they allowed to switch on uh, the lights. That might be interpreted as an experiment in sustainability or energy saving. Uh, however, if you look at the towers, you see that the only thing lit uh, are the plant rooms which occur every 14 floors because uh, the vast majority of these apartments are either sold and not lived in uh, or they stand empty uh, altogether. Uh, at which point architecture becomes an interesting phenomenon. If buildings are not lived in, they can become thinner and thinner and thinner to the point that they stop being buildings and in a way become a tradable form of, of art, uh, concrete art uh, in this sense. Real estate, and 75% of all real estate is housing, is the largest economic asset class in the world at this moment, larger than oil, oil reserves, gas reserves, gold, uh, digital currency, whatever. This is the biggest pillar of the economic system, whether it's lived in or not. Um, it means that buildings in recent decades uh, are traded at phenomenal profits, which means that buildings accrue value over the course of their existence at often record-breaking profit margins, which means buildings become more expensive, uh, which means that average house prices actually far exceed uh, the mortgage limits set uh, by banks. So modern housing is now part of this rent race uh, where, where housing becomes increasingly uh, uh, unaffordable. I would like to present a case. This is the list uh, of uh, the most livable cities last year. Vienna, Melbourne, Osaka, Calgary, Vancouver. Um, these are cities where the average salary uh, is relatively high, but where real estate and thus also housing is also relatively expensive. And housing is more expensive than salaries are high. If you do a bit of math on the average uh, salaries. Uh, an average, an affordable house is a house for a price which is two and a half times uh, the annual income of a normal person. If you do that arithmetic uh, on, on, on the 10 most livable cities, this is the amount of square meters that a normal person can buy uh, as an affordable home. 15 square meters, and the more livable the city, the smaller the house you can buy in it, which is a curious case for density, uh, I just realized. Um, 15 square meters is uh, three by five meters. This is a person in 15 square meters. 15 square meters is bigger than a maximum security prison cell, uh, smaller uh, than a Jayco uh, caravan, uh, and slightly uh, bigger than uh, a car parking uh, space. 15 square meters is in fact smaller than what was defined as the existence minimum uh, during the Russian uh, Revolution as part of the early communist system. 15 square meters is about the size of a container, which probably explains why containers are so incredibly popular as a form of housing in inner uh, cities. I think the curious thing is that in recent decades, modern architecture has continued to exist, but it has traded down. What once was affordable for average people is now increasingly beyond the reach of average people. Buildings are still white. Buildings still have lots of glass. They still have 90 degree corners. They have all the hallmarks of the enlightened modern architecture of the previous century, but they've become part of an economic uh, logic which is largely to the detriment uh, uh, of people. I'm sure that the outcome of this process is that the average affordable home is a coffin. Um, what could possibly 
be done. Uh, I think only a very radical intervention in the economy of buildings is necessary for this to change, and it's not even a question of, of design. These are the three pillars uh, of Vitruvius upon which architecture ought to be based. Uh, durability, functionality, and beauty. Uh, I think there are compelling reasons not to believe this at face value anymore. In, uh, in the 1500s, a building used to last for 300 years. Then in the 19th century, a building lasted for a mere 150 years. In the early 20th century, buildings lasted on average 100 years. In the late 20th century, buildings lasted 50 years. Uh, in the even later 20th century, building lasted for 25 years. And it is not Im unimaginable that buildings will actually expire uh, before they are designed, so that the economic life span of a building will be negative, which means uh, that, that one, rather than planning its construction, one plans their demolition of sorts. It also means that this ethos might have to be uh, replaced by its three antonyms, temporarity, flexibility, and discretion rather than beauty. That this architectural, 2,000 year architectural ethos might have to be replaced by this architectural ethos. This is a formal petrol station, now Cinerolium. It is a building used for what it was not intended. Uh, it is a building that can be taken away uh, very easily, can be constructed everywhere, and whether or not it's beauty, I think, is a question of opinion. Um, it also means that a particular type of architecture from the previous century can undergo a very radical process. This is in East Germany, um, a, a, a former communist housing estate. You have plenty of that still uh, yourselves uh, being demolished. But since it's a prefabricated building, interestingly, its demolition is identical to its construction, but the film is played in reverse. You end up with the same spare parts uh, as you start started with. These spare parts can be packaged, moved, reappropriate to in a way become the beginning of a new type of architecture. Well, new, I think it is arguable. This is a recent bungalow, uh, about five years old, in Brandenburg, near to the uh, housing estate that was demolished. It looks 19th century, but it's entirely composed of building panels from a uh, uh, a large uh, housing estate and a pitched roof and a layer of stucco in a way conceal all the traces. If things can be recycled, they could be moved. Uh, perhaps bigger buildings can be moved. Perhaps entire cities can be treated with exactly the same uh, spirit. Once you separate buildings from eternity, and particularly real estate from its uh, tying to land, once they become recyclable and movable objects, I think we could see a very interesting thing, is that buildings, like any industrial consumer product, could be part of the normal value devolution, which means that we could have second-hand buildings at a cheaper price and that they could be brought within the realm of affordability if that economic intervention were made. And that therefore the classic expression of nedvijimosht uh, could become dvijimosht, essentially buildings as movable and recyclable uh, assets as a way to break the affordability crisis in housing. Thank you. Thank you, Renier. Very provocative presentation to bring uh, different angles on how to understand this issue um, in the contemporary market, contemporary economy. And I want to start a, a round of questions, uh, starting with you. Uh, when you're doing this uh, strong body of research, while at the same time working on projects, how do you incorporate something, some of this maybe in, in the housing projects that you have led in, in Stockholm or in, or in London? Um, well, f first of all, I, I don't think this is research, this is common sense. Uh, in a way, because I mean, they're, they're public figures. Anybody can, can construct the story. Any person in any major city sees this happening. Uh, escalating housing prices. So I, I don't think it's research. Secondly, um, we encounter a, a healthy 
uh, problem, in particularly in our housing projects, to the point that I would say the one we've done in London is probably part uh, of the same cycle, and I would have happily presented it uh, as part of the problem uh, had there been more uh, time. The more recent projects we've done, both in Stockholm and particularly in Rotterdam, the housing projects, uh, they are all recyclable, which is why they have very high sustainability scores, because they can all be taken apart, similarly to the example I showed, recycled, expanded, changed, and taken away with almost no uh, waste. So they are entirely prefabricated industrial buildings, which can be demolished without waste and be completely recycled. Um, well, you also show at the beginning the failure of the modern movement, uh, it, projects that you can go to analyze and you will see that there was a problem of uh, adaptability, evolution, but also the, in terms of the social component, they were becoming uh, highly pressure, uh, with a high pressure. So now that they were facing this issue of uh, housing, a uh, rising global population, more density, where we start to live more closer, more together, uh, this other layer of architecture, this uh, how people are going to be behave in a civilized way, mm -hmm. becomes very important. And I want to pose these questions for, for all, for the four of you, but to start with you, Rinir. How do we, do we incorporate this other layer? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the fundamental shift that I try to get at, I think there is modern housing from the last century, there is modern housing from this century. The only difference is that modern housing used to be synonymous to social housing, it no longer is. And I think part of these buildings, why they have disappeared, social problems, crimes, etc., and admittedly they all dis existed, have always been blamed for it. I think part of the problem why they are demolished is that they do not lend themselves for buildings to become speculative, tradable objects in the market economy. Most of the projects I showed were either a project of a communist system or the project of a welfare state in the West, which is not a one-on-one -on -one system that regards buildings as tradable uh, objects and therefore builds differently. And, and we have still something that stylistically looks like modern architecture, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the property of the market economy and therefore operates completely according to different laws, at which point also the style of modernity becomes uh, meaningless. Uh, and unless something economically fundamentally changes, that will continue to be the case, is my point. Perfect. Yuri, what do you think about this issue on how, uh, as we live more together in big density, how this social uh, aspect of architecture will happen, especially thinking about a project such as SEAL, where 50,000 people will start to living together? I believe that all cities uh, have uh, a different destiny, so to speak, and Moscow, like many other Russian cities and towns. Quite long ago, I would say 20 years ago, it had been, uh, had been introduced to a capitalism system, been totally unprepared for a new world of capitalism, and as of today, we could assert that um, all the housing construction is being done in Moscow um, based on based on some sort of um, resource approach and then uh, urban planning approach and uh, in this regard I realize that this can be changed only only if we involve the whole community into this process, but it does take place. And I think that Urban Forum is uh, one of the uh, key events in this regard. And uh, actually, Zeal Reconstruction uh, Project in Moscow was a result of the very first Urban Forum when it became obvious that the previous factory area, Zeal, uh, 
uh, could simply not be built with a standard uh, typology because the, its zeal is an economic function of Moscow. And um, now it's simply a matter of selling a certain number of square meters. When we won the contest for redevelopment of the zeal area in Moscow, we were planning to um, to make uh, self-regulatory territory, self-management uh, territory. We thought that there will be a community and all the houses will be like a condos <coughs> where people um, can come, gather together, and build their own housing as they um, see fit. We thought it will be a very small lot that within just one quarter there will be like four houses which will be built by different developers. And I would say that we uh, succeeded um, in implementing this vision by 10% only. But such a big territory is uh, given only to one developer. We're speaking about 300 hectares, and this developer is making decisions of how people are going to live in this vast space. And everybody is trying to do it as good as they could. But I think that in, without interdisciplinary uh, urban practices, we cannot and should not develop such big territories, and this has to be done as soon as possible about all the projects which are being implemented in Moscow. We have to build spaces for living, and we have to limit ourselves um, in terms of number of square meters we would like to build. We have to overcome this market pressure to build more and to give less space to people. We have to uh, deal with this issue. And Bini, how do you address this question of how the living will happen on this new density? A couple of words, <clears throat> because we are framing the discussion a little bit. And um, um, housing is indeed about 63% of the, of the built stock that we have. So the majority of our buildings in cities are about housing, fair. So that's why it, the, the subject is important. There are a lot of issues that surround housing in, uh, in this um, uh, matter. It is uh, about the cityscape and how we do that. It's about uh, adaptability to new generations, um, and Ranier was speaking about that. And it's about inclusion at moments of, um, of, um, of separation and polarization. And so that is uh, fair enough to, uh, to discuss. On the last issue, that, uh, on this inclusion, of affordable housing, uh, you can notate. I think that deserves an, uh, an extra, say, panel almost, with an overview of how different countries are doing that. To compare that, it could be a next mm -hmm. common sense or research to be uh, to be uh, to be understood. Um, Hong Kong does it a complete different way, is a, a, with repetition everywhere, and manages in itself to to arrange a great kind of variety of people, even if the ground prices are. Uh, skyrocketing at the moment. So they have a strong law on that, a strong common sense. So what you, quest what you ask is how can we develop this common sense as a society, as a city and as a, uh, as a country and it maybe as a globe in the end. Uh, yes, in these kind of circumstances, you can see that, the, that uh, the northern European countries define in any place now 30% minimally of social and affordable housing in any project, even on the Champs-Élysées to be made, or um, in another 30% for the lower middle class to be done, and another 10% for, for this moment for affordable working places. So not only the housing, we should talk about that in order to balance a, a, pro, a probable, and, and Rainier is right on that, a probable polarization on this, on, on this case. So, we, and that, so I mean, yes, we have to plead for that. In the, for, and we can do that in a nuanced way, from a kind of national laws. Uh, and I think you are updating, you're, I mean, Russia is updating its laws on that in a, in, in a very good way, I must say. And you can accommodate that in the private market um, by uh, asking that, uh, that properties should be shared in that way. It should be shared to avoid the monsters uh, that... Uh, that Rania was showing. So I see a, a, quite an effort to do that. The, you can do that also in density. I mean, I think the density issue is so completely, has another issue. I mean, uh, suburbia is not also on my wish list, to be honest. It spoils our landscapes. It uh, costs 
much more money to make uh, and to keep suburbanity alive with uh, infrastructure and with uh, uh, in all its means that I, uh, it is an ecological disaster up till now unless we can solve the mobility in the future so the coming 20 years it is still is so we should not avoid density in many places to, uh, to make it possible and in that kind of circumstances under that kind of pressure maybe looking to New York as a case where somehow the affordability laws are going to be um, ex extensively uh, put in the, on, the, on the political uh, agenda maybe there we can test again that laboratory of the social housing and affordable housing issues and yes it should be on the agenda of uh, the so-called star architects that normally work for uh, museums Thank you, Vini. Um, Sergey, how do you address this question of how we are going to live into this more dense context, especially taking from the principles that you show in your presentation? Well, first of all, I do not think that the only possible trend is increased density of cities. And since we meet here in Russia, the idea of this forum is to promote urban planning in Russia and Russian cities. I think this is not the trend we need. In these large cities, mega cities of over a million, Moscow, St. Petersburg, the fact that they're growing so fast in terms of density, in terms of population size, in my view, is a negative trend because small and medium-sized cities that are strong in other countries that become engines of growth, of culture, take Germany, where I live a lot. So it's a counterexample. So I don't like the trend that we see in Russia, this ever-increasing density or height of buildings results in inflow of people and it undermines comfort of mega cities. So it's a negative trend. This should that should be reversed. Maybe it is working in other countries, but it definitely doesn't for Moscow where we are. I don't think we need this trend at all. Thank you, Sergei. Uh, thank you to all the participants uh, for sharing with us uh, diverse points of view on the future of housing, uh, but at the same time uh, that reflect on the scale and the necessity of this. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you.